Good morning and welcome to the forum. My name is Mike. I am the rector here for those of you I don't know. Um, we're really glad. Today we didn't quite know that this was happening. Um, we decided this month in February to focus not just on black history but on the present reality of our diverse community and on realities that are particularly faced by the black community in St. Louis. And we'd been invited in to do a screening of Rigged, which we're doing later on today. And we thought it would be important to talk about voter suppression, which in our area especially affects the black community very heavily. And two different groups of people started talking about who we wanted to invite in to talk about voter suppression. And both of them ended up with Denise Lieberman, and so she got two invites from two different groups at Holy Communion, which was a little confusing, but I'm really glad uh, that we get to hear from Denise both this morning and this evening after the screening of Rigged. I'm not going to take up a lot more time than that. I'm going to invite our parishioner, Bob Lovis, who invited Denise this morning, to come and introduce her. Hello, everybody. Um, you might know I'm a journalist, and um, in 2018, I wrote an article surveying voter suppression across the country for a magazine called Progressive. And I proposed the story because everything I was hearing about voter suppression was making me angry. Uh, things like voters being purged from the rolls for bogus reasons, unnecessary photo ID requirements, limits on early voting. Uh, and those are just a few of the examples of how some elected leaders are, are trying to cripple democracy. Um, and one of the people I interviewed was our speaker, Denise. She's been angry about this issue longer, way longer than I've been. She has been fighting in the courts for voting rights for two decades for a time as the legal director of the local ACLU chapter, and now as the director of the Power and Democracy Program. That's operated by a national racial justice group called the Advancement Project. She's litigated voting rights cases in states such as Florida and North Carolina, as well as Missouri. She's a national expert on voter ID laws, and she's testified before Congress and various state legislatures. And she's also basically helped shepherd and consulted on a documentary that we're going to see tonight called Rigged about voter suppression. So we're going to take one third of our, one third of our time with Denise uh, reviewing what's happening on a nationwide scale, and then another third looking at what is happening in St. Louis and Missouri, and in the last third of our forum, we'll spend on what we can do as citizens in response to this threat. And we can also uh, take questions from uh, everybody here in the room. So without further ado, let me introduce Denise. Good morning. I'm going to stand to the side of the podium, I think. <laughs> Thank you so much, Robert, for inviting me to, to come here today to Holy Communion. It's really an honor to be here, um, particularly as a lifelong Eucidian. Uh, I see a few familiar faces in the room. I went to grade school just a couple blocks away from here. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm really happy to be here today to talk to you about the fight for the right to vote. And... Um, some of the, the challenges we have to ensure that all people are able to, to cast a ballot. And it's, um, it's particularly um, gratifying to be here in, in a space of faith because I, I think it's really important to take these discussions outside of the realm of partisan politics because there's something much bigger going on when we talk about the right to vote. There is a, a moral imperative about who has a right to have a voice that um, is missing from these discussions when we limit talking about voting to, to 
partisan forces and particular candidates and particular elected officials. Because really the fight for the right to vote is, is really about a, a bigger fight for um, self-determination and, and the rights of all people to have a say in their own destinies. So I'm going to... So as Robert mentioned, I'm a, a national voting rights attorney. I'm really um, privileged to be able to do this work and have had the chance to work on voting rights all around the country, including right here in Missouri, where I coordinate the Missouri Voter Protection Coalition, uh, which is a coalition of about three dozen nonpartisan uh, organizations around the state. We're kind of an ad hoc coalition uh, that, that works to protect the right to vote. And we've been meeting since 2006 when Missouri first uh, passed its first iteration of a strict photo ID law. Among other things that we do um, around this time of the year, our coalition tracks legislation that's pending in the Missouri legislature. We testify on bills. Uh, and um, during election season, we also coordinate the statewide election protection efforts. And I'm going to tell you a little more about that towards the end of our presentation. But election protection is a, a national, is the nation's largest um, nonpartisan election monitoring program. And uh, we've got a really robust program here in Missouri, and it's, it's really easy to participate. We have attorneys who answer calls into the hotline, and we have folks that, we, that are placed at polling places around the state simply to provide information, a friendly smile, a helping hand uh, to, to voters who are attempting to, to navigate the, the voting process. We um, actually, our election protection headquarters and command center here in St. Louis is actually located uh, at Central Reform Congregation in the Central West End. And uh, there's a photo of us from 2018, I think, a group of, or at least a partial group of us. So I want us to take a step back and think about sort of why voting is important. You know, we, we have this kind of um, discordant relationship with the truth when it comes to voting in this country. We like to think of ourselves as a robust democracy. And even, frankly, throughout our nation's history, uh, we have lauded um, the freedom that we have and the access to the vote that we have, even while simultaneously working to strip that right or keep that right from vast proportions of our population. And so here you've got the Supreme Court um, in 1886, saying, oh, the right to vote is fundamental because it's preservative of all other rights, all while around them, 10 of the 11 southern states were rewriting their state constitutions right during this time period to implement literacy tests and poll taxes and grandfather clauses to strip um, newly freed African Americans of their right to vote. And so really what we see is that the fight for the right to vote throughout our nation's history has, has been a battle from the get-go. We have never had a full democracy. We have never allowed all people to have a say or a voice in their destinies. And really the only way that we have expanded access to the franchise is when we fought for it. right? And so 100 years ago this year, Congress finally passed the women's suffrage Amendment. After 70 years, three generations of protests, Oops. including civil disobedience at the White House to prompt that. And of course, in order to enact passage of the Voting Rights Act, were decades of movement building by leaders on the ground and protests. That's, of course, Congressman John Lewis at the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Okay, right, and so every battle for access to the vote, every battle for a voice has, has come um, through tremendous effort, grassroots movement building, uh, and great sacrifice and, and violence throughout our nation's history. <laughs> 
right? And so I want to take us back, though, to sort of why we vote and, and why I think it's so important, particularly for communities of faith, to have an active voice uh, in this battle, right? What is voting really about? And I would suggest to you um, that it has far less to do with who you're going to actually vote for for president next no this November, because more fundamentally, who we decide to have a voice says everything about who we value as human beings in this society. And that, I would submit to you, is a decidedly moral question. I had the privilege um, for a number of years of, of working in North Carolina alongside um, Reverend, now Bishop, William Barber. I had the chance to represent him when he was um, president of the North Carolina State Conference of the NAACP. We filed a lawsuit challenging um, a, a massive voter suppression law in that state, and he invited me to speak at Repairs of the Breach, which he now leads, of course, as part of um, his, his um, Moral Monday movement um, and, and the Poor People's Campaign. And he really um, taught me such an important lesson about the moral imperative of voting. Because at the end of the day, the right to vote is about basic human dignity. Voting is a structural mechanism that gives people the opportunity to have a voice, to have a say, to have simply control over their own destinies, to have self-determination. That's what voting is about, the ability to make decisions in my own community about what I want for myself, for my family, for my children. It is decidedly about dignity. It literally is the way that society says you count. Literally, right? We count you. And so when the right to vote is impaired, abridged, denied, particularly for classes of individuals, what does that say? It says you don't count. And that is why this fight for the right to vote is a decidedly moral one. And it's why communities of faith throughout history have been the leaders in fighting to push greater expansions of access for voting. And yet, here we are today standing on the shoulders of people who fought such tremendous battles to expand access to the vote 100 years after women's suffrage, 55 years after passage of the Voting Rights Act, and again are fighting these same battles over and over again simply to ensure the right to have a voice in our own destinies. And the truth of the matter is that um, in the last decade, we have seen more legislative efforts to curtail and limit the right to vote than at any other period of our nation's history outside of the post-Reconstruction era. This is Rosanelle Eaton. She was our lead plaintiff in that North Carolina litigation I mentioned. Um, she was 92 when we brought the lawsuit. Um, I think she was 95 when that uh, photo was taken, and we were still in court um, appealing at the Court of Appeals, and that was the quote she gave to the Washington Post the day we went into that courthouse. Rosanelle Eaton um, was the first African-American woman to register to vote in her county in North Carolina, and to do so, she had to take a literacy test. This is not ancient history, folks. I mean, Rosanelle Eaton passed away um, in late 2018. But she was a plaintiff in this lawsuit just a few years ago. She had to take a literacy test. She had to go to the county seat where she had to stand straight and was surrounded by a circle of, of white men who told her to recite the preamble to the United States Constitution from memory. I'm a constitutional lawyer and a professor at Washington University where I teach constitutional law. I doubt I could recite 
the preamble of the Constitution from memory, and certainly not under um, a very sort of stress-induced situation. And she did it. And she proceeded then not only to become the first African-American to register to vote in her county in North Carolina in the 1940s, but she proceeded to teach others how to pass that test as well. She told us uh, in, in court that she stopped counting after she had registered 5,000 people to vote. That's when she stopped counting. And here she was again, having to fight for those same rights. She was the plaintiff in that case because um, the photo ID requirement of that law affected her. Solely because of little glitches in her underlying documents, birth certificate, social security, had her name spelled slightly differently. One had Rosanelle as a first name, one had Rosa as a first name, Nell as a middle name. She had to go to 10 different government offices and change her social security in order to correct that situation. And so the kinds of voter suppression efforts we have seen in the last decade that really are targeted, and if you come to um, see uh, Rigged tonight, you'll really get a much broader sense of um, the, the underlying uh, uh, motivations behind that. But really, we see it starting with the 2008 elections where you saw um, voter turnout among communities of color um, for the first time in our nation's history um, come close to equaling white voter turnout. Youth voter turnout was its highest in our nation's history. Voter turnout by people with a high school education. Voter turnout by people earning under $35,000 a year. Highest in our nation's history. And this was a backlash to that. Right? And so what we began to see after the 2010 midterm elections, which resulted in... Um, turnovers in state legislatures is in addition to a redrawing of the district lines, which happens every year, every 10 years in a process called redistricting, we also saw implementation of new laws. I um, was tracking our national legislation during that time period, and here we are, it's like February 2011. State legislatures had been in session like a month and a half at this point, because most of them go back into session in January. 34 states had, had introduced nearly identical pieces of photo ID legislation by that time period. Today, um, over 30 states require some form of identification to cast a ballot at the polls, um, including a number that have strict requirements that make it very difficult um, and don't really have provisions for folks that don't have one of those very limited forms of identification. We've also seen efforts to um, implement documentary proof of citizenship, which come with similar barriers to that photo ID requirements do for people that simply don't have access to those underlying documents. If you don't have a copy of your naturalization papers, it's gonna cost you about 300 bucks to get it. Okay, um, right next door to us in, in the state of Kansas, former Kansas Secretary of State Chris Kobach was a major champion of um, efforts to require documentary proof of citizenship uh, and continues to be, even though he lost his election for governor and even though courts have struck down those efforts time and time and time again. But we continue to hear um, um, from leaders, even at the very top of our nation, um, a call for this kind of um, um, provision. Voter purges, as Robert mentioned, have also proliferated, particularly in the, the, the last four to six years. Even in just a two-year period, according to the Election Assistance Commission, you see some 17 million people getting purged from the voter rolls. And these voter purges have been made much easier in the wake of a major Supreme Court ruling about two years ago um, that opens the door to more purges of valid registered voters, uh, simply for not showing up to vote. 
This is just the two-year period between 2016 and 2018. And what we see is that, um, that, that communities of color, communities that were formerly covered by the Voting Rights Act, had a significantly higher purge rate. And you don't need to go any further for examples of the impact of this than to Georgia last year. <laughs> That's Stacey Abrams who um, ran against um, uh, Brian Kemp for governor of Georgia. And Brian Kemp, of course, at that time was Secretary of State. He was running the elections. He was running his own election that he was a candidate in. And he um, quite notably um, instituted massive, massive voter purges, purging 1.2 million people from the voter rolls um, disproportionately in um, counties that had high um, uh, proportions of African Americans uh, and using very flawed um, sort of purge practices that I won't sort of get bore you with the details of, but there's a reason that, that, that it's important to, to follow some of the national federal guidelines for this because if you don't, if you, um, for example, one of the things he does is, is um, uses very loose comparisons to see, for example, he might take a voter roll from a neighboring state and see if, if Denise Lieberman is listed. And if so, would remove Denise Lieberman from Georgia. Well, there's a lot of people named Denise. You'd be actually surprised. I had no idea. I thought I was the only one, but apparently not. Um, <laughs> and, and, and the truth is that there um, are, are very high error rates um, when these things are not done right. And in fact, studies of the purge uh, in Georgia uh, immediately preceding the November 2018 election where Stacey Abrams ran against Brian Kemp uh, showed that um, a, a significant proportion of um, his voter purges that happened right on the eve of the election were actually faulty and that these were actually valid voters. Other provisions we've seen include laws that, that keep people from exercising their right to vote um, because they have a criminal record, even after they've paid their debt to society, even after they've served a period of incarceration. And these laws date back to the post-Reconstruction era. Um, these criminal disenfranchisement laws were really targeted, particularly in states in the South, um, after the Civil War, as a way to keep newly enfranchised African Americans off of the voter rolls. And indeed, um, that disparate impact is it, it incredibly um, prevalent in these laws today. Here in the United States, um, upwards of six million people who have a criminal record have no voice. And here's what's even more amazing, is that over three-fourths of them are not in prison. 77% of people who cannot vote because of a felon disenfranchisement law are not incarcerated. They live and work in our communities on probation, on parole, in some states that permanently disenfranchise people, under no state supervision. These are people that pay taxes that attend our churches, that go to school, whose kids go to school with our kids, and, and they cannot vote. And it should be no surprise that, um, that the numbers of people who are kept out of our democracy because of these laws has risen incredibly with um, the rise of the prison industrial complex, the war on drugs starting in the 1980s that have also disproportionately targeted communities of color. Which is why we see such a disparate impact in these laws. In certain states, um, that had permanent disenfranchisement laws like Florida until last year. Florida was one of four states that said if you've ever had a felony, you can never vote again for the rest of your life. No matter how long ago that was. No matter where it took place. And that law had the effect of keeping fully 10% of the state's voting age population from ever being able to vote. And when you looked at that, with African-American men, fully 25% of Florida's African-American men of voting over age 18 
were permanently denied the right to vote. 25%, one in four. Hang on, I wanna show you. We uh, at Advancement Project put together um, a report. We um, did some geo-tracking and, and decided to see who these folks were. And of course, um, because of racial disparities in the criminal justice system, because of ongoing housing segregation, what we learned was that um, not only were 25% of the state's African American men completely disenfranchised, but they were concentrated in particular communities, right? And so what we found was that 10 counties in particular had such high rates of disenfranchisement that you have entire neighborhoods, entire communities that had virtually no voice at all in their government, virtually no say at all in how their hard-earned tax dollars were being spent in the status of the schools their children went to. When you have entire communities without a voice, that's not real democracy. And of course, then there's no accountability. Why would elected officials be responsive to those communities? They didn't elect them. And indeed, um, that's why many folks have been advocating, and social science data proves that Voting actually instills good citizenship. Study after study after study shows that for people who have committed crimes, having access to the right to vote reduces recidivism. And it just makes sense, right? When you vote, you have a stake in your community. When you don't, you don't. But here's what's really amazing, and this is the part that gives me hope as we start to move on. Um, last year, in, in 2018, voters in Florida passed a constitutional amendment to restore voting rights to people with felonies. And what's really incredible, right? First of all, it's incredible that, 60, that nearly two-thirds of the state voted in favor of this. And remember, not a single one of them had a felony. Not a single one of those voters, because they weren't allowed to participate in that election. That's incredible. And so, and, and that's a state that also in 2018, by the way, elected a Republican governor and a Republican United States Senator. And yet two thirds of them voted to restore voting rights to people with former felonies. And so what we see is that, is that these laws have gotten more um, pervasive and continued again. Ah. After the United States Supreme Court gutted a key provision of the Voting Rights Act in 2013. Because in 2012, all those states with red dots they were not allowed to implement their new voting restrictions. Those were mostly photo ID laws. Because the Voting Rights Act preclearance provisions blocked those laws from going into effect. After the United States Supreme Court gutted that piece of the Voting Rights Act, it opened the door to a horde of new legislation that now doesn't have that stopgap. It was a case called Shelby v. Holder, and it blocked the formula for determining which states had to comply with that provision. These were the states that had been covered. It was a, it was a provision that said, if, if you have a history of notorious discrimination in voting, you have to run any new voting changes by the federal government so they can do an assessment of whether or not they would be racially retrogressive. 
That law is no longer in effect. That law was absolutely critical to blocking discriminatory voting provisions. But that's not how some members of the majority saw it. Um, Justice Scalia felt that the Voting Rights Act was a racial entitlement. Though Ruth Bader Ginsburg offered um, a different perspective in her dissenting opinion when she said, when you're throwing out the Voting Rights Act, it's like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. <laughs> and unfortunately, she was right. When that umbrella went away, those states went right back to introducing those laws. Two-thirds of, of the formerly covered states that very same year implemented new voting restrictions, including North Carolina, which is why Rosenell Eaton, in her 90s, had to get up and do all of this all over again. There we are in front of the courthouse. I just have a couple photos because it was just an incredible opportunity to be part of this case. And we won, ultimately. After five years in litigation, we finally won with the Court of Appeals arguing that and concluding that North Carolina's law had been acted, enacted and targeted African Americans with almost surgical precision. But the truth of the matter is that, that we're not winning everywhere. The evidence in, in the North Carolina case was, was just overwhelming because lawmakers there were very flagrant in um, their representations of what that law would do. Um, and we're not winning other places. Uh, and, and I don't believe we can continue to rely on the courts to protect this most basic and fundamental of rights. Yes. I wanted to add something about the photo ID law that I think would maybe give people a chuckle. Um, I interviewed a person Bob, about Bob. Uh, a voting rights expert about photo ID laws, and he said, this expert on photo ID laws said, um, more people are struck and killed by lightning than walk into a polling place and pretend to be somebody else. It's sort of a, it's a non-existent problem in the big scheme of things. Uh, this guy says, you know, over like a 10-year period, he counted 250 cases over billions of votes cast in state and federal elections. So it's really sort of a, sort of a joke. Yeah, and, and this is a report that I authored as these laws started to proliferate around the country. But um, Missouri is, in fact, um, a tremendous case study about how these laws work. We're still fighting against photo ID here in Missouri um, some 15 years after we first started this fight. Missouri was one of the very first states to enact a strict photo ID law back in 2006. And we filed a lawsuit. It went all the way up to the Missouri Supreme Court. The Missouri Supreme Court concluded that it violated our state constitutional protections for the right to vote. And they struck it down. That case was called Weinshank versus State. That's Kathleen Weinshank right there. Um, she was a, a, a voter. She has cerebral palsy. and. Um, she, uh, the state had argued that, well, you know, you can, if you don't have a photo ID, because, you know, Ms. Weinshank doesn't drive, she doesn't have a driver's license, uh, and these laws, um, they do more than simply require voters to show some form of identification. That would be okay, because most people have some kind of identification. What these laws do is they limited the kind of ID you can show just to the kind of ID that you get like at the DMV, a driver's license, non-driver's license. And those can be really hard to get because you have to have a certified birth certificate to get them. And so if there's any glitches on that underlying paperwork, and by the way, if your name has changed since birth, like say you've been married or divorced, if you're a female, you changed your name, or if you had a court order name change, you're gonna have to have legal documentation of all of that too. The law had a provision that said, well, if you don't have any of that, just cast a provisional ballot and it'll count if your signature matches. Well, for someone like Kathleen Weinshank, that, that would never be the case. She can't replicate her signature. But she was, she was and is, she continues to this day. Actually, this photo was just taken um, last year at a community event. She's still incredibly active in, in state politics. Um, wanted to be able to vote. She had a, a range of other forms of secondary IDs. <laughs> 
And yet, despite the fact that the Missouri Supreme Court ruled that photo ID was unconstitutional, every year since 2006, lawmakers in Jefferson City kept reintroducing photo ID proposals. Now, you would think that as a legislature, they might say, maybe we should not enact unconstitutional laws, laws that the Supreme Court has clearly said are unconstitutional. Instead, what they did was they said, well, if this law is unconstitutional, let's change the Constitution. And sadly, that's what we did. Uh, in uh, a measure that was on the 2016 ballot, it amended part of the Missouri Constitution. It didn't take out that right to vote, but it carved out an exception to uh, allow a photo ID law to be implemented. And that's what they did. So here we are, we're with, this was a press conference in front of the old courthouse downtown the day the law went into effect. Um, and it was a, it's, it's now been partially struck down by the Missouri Supreme Court, yet again, in a decision that came down just a few weeks ago. Now the law was intended to require voters to show photo ID. But lawmakers knew they had to have provisions for voters that didn't have a photo ID. And so they said, OK, you can vote with a secondary form of ID as long as you sign a legal statement, a legal affidavit. More lawsuits were filed. And in, on January 14th, the Missouri Supreme Court said, that legal statement is unconstitutional. It's deceptive. It's misleading. And I'll tell you why in a minute. So now, as a result, just to give you the, the takeaway here, in Missouri, as you guys get ready to vote next month in the presidential primaries, you can vote with a photo ID or a non-photo ID and get a regular ballot, and you don't have to go through any extra hoops, OK? So this law originally said, well, you're going to have to show one of these strict forms of photo ID, like a driver's license or a non-driver's license. And if you don't have that, you can show, say, your voter registration card. You would think that that would be a, a really valid form of ID because the only people who get mailed a voter registration card are people who are on the rolls of registered voters the week before the election. It's an actually incredibly accurate way <laughs> to determine if you are a validly registered voter. Um, now you can use those things. Originally under the law, if you showed, say, a, a voter registration card or a student ID, you would have to sign this legal statement under penalty of perjury that said I have to, that I understand a photo ID is required to vote. And that's one reason the Missouri Supreme Court said that that statement was illegal, because clearly the law allowed you to vote without that photo ID. The third part of the law says if you don't have any ID at all, and this part is still in effect, if you have no ID at all, you can vote a provisional ballot, but that ballot's only going to count if you go back to your polling place on election day, before the polls close, with a photo ID. So if you didn't have it that morning when you showed up at your polling place, um, you're probably not going to have it that evening, unless you had just left it at home. or the signature on your provisional ballot envelope matches your original voter registration. For people like Kathleen Weinshank, that would never happen. Even for people like my own mother, who um, you'll hear about in a minute, um, who now suffers from a hand tremor. She originally registered to vote in 1952, I think, uh, in Missouri. Her signature does not match. She cannot replicate her signature. And so this is what happened just a couple weeks ago. The Missouri Supreme Court said that that part of the law was contradictory and misleading. And as a result, people can vote in March, in August, in November, a regular ballot with a photo ID or a non-photo ID. And election officials are not allowed to represent 
that a photo ID is required. That's just some language from the case. So just to recap, you can vote in Missouri with any form of identification, a photo ID or a non-photo ID. I want to tell you this, I'm, I'm repeating it because not everybody has gotten the memo about that. Because our state hasn't been so good about informing voters that that's the case. We're informing election officials. Because in fact, the trial court in this very case made the very same conclusion a few weeks before the November 2018 midterm elections and failed to tell local election officials um, clearly enough that a photo ID was not required to vote. And so here we are, this is a photo I took um, in our command center in November 2018 and we were getting flooded with phone calls from election officials who were, I mean, from voters who were being told they had to present a photo ID to vote. And we ended up having to file a lawsuit on election day uh, against St. Charles County where um, the, the, the problems were particularly uh, prolific. They were prolific everywhere, but that one was a pretty bad one. We won that lawsuit, but the point of the matter is that these laws can be confusing and confusion can sow voter suppression because people who are confused about what their rights are don't know how to advocate and assert their rights. That's one reason why election protection is so important. Right? And I don't need to get into sort of all the reasons that these laws are problematic. We know that, that people are not pretending to be someone else at the polls, especially in a place like Missouri, where you have to show some form of identification to vote. For me to show up and pretend to be you at the polls would require me to undertake a, a massive sort of conspiracy to get a form of identification, of your identification. I would have to show up at my polling place and presume that the poll workers don't know who you are. And I know for many of us you know, who maybe live around here, those, those poll workers have been working at these polls for 20 years. They know everybody who's walking through that door, right? It would be very hard for me to, be, to pretend to be you and to steal a form of your identification. And I would be, could, could be convicted of a felony and lose my right to vote for the rest of my life, all to potentially influence one vote. It just doesn't happen. And yet what we do know is that a lot of people in Missouri don't have one of those strict forms of photo ID. I'm going to backtrack just a minute because here's what's happened since just in the last three weeks. Like I said, in, uh, uh, in January, on January 14th, the Missouri Supreme Court ruled that that photo ID requirement could not be implemented as a strict requirement, that voters need to be allowed to show a photo or non-photo ID. One week after that, the Missouri legislature heard testimony in yet again another photo ID bill. It's House Bill 1600. It would eliminate all those non-photo ID options. This is going on in the Missouri legislature right now as we speak and require a photo ID to vote. I showed up there. I testified. Secretary State Ashcroft test was the only person who testified in favor of the legislation. I testified in opposition to it. I thought, how many times does the Missouri Supreme Court have to tell you that this is unconstitutional? And yet, um, the House Elections Committee did pass House Bill 1600 out of uh, committee, so it's headed, to, it's headed to a floor vote, and we might be back in court yet again um, on a photo ID requirement in Missouri heading into 2020. Any guesses what the cost of our state government for that nonsense is? The costs? I do have a sense of that, because actually, I <laughs> I'm going to tell you in just a second, but First, I just want to sort of point out that these laws have real impacts. You know, I, we can talk about policy, but these are real human beings. What this represents is the number of people, and this is actually an even more accurate count. Secretary Ashcroft himself pulled these numbers. What they did was they took the list of registered voters and asked the Missouri Department of Revenue how many of those folks have a DMV ID. So these are the numbers of valid registered voters, people who are eligible to vote, who are on the voter rolls, who don't have a state-issued photo ID if a strict photo ID requirement were in effect. 
And these measures um, don't fall evenly across the population, right? Um, groups that are less likely to have cars, have drive, have driver's licenses, or who are more likely to have glitches in their underlying documents are much less likely to have a photo ID or people who are less likely to be able to get to a DMV office. Right, and so what we know is that these burdens disproportionately fall on uh, working class citizens, senior citizens, young voters, voters with disabilities, and disproportionately voters of color. And why is it hard? Because all these underlying documents, these measures that we put in place as, as, as part of national security measures after 9-11, make it much harder to get a state ID if you don't have that paper trail that goes all the way back to your certified birth certificate. And if you're not from this state, you're gonna have to get those documents from the original state. That can cost money. A number of states actually require you to have a photo ID to get a copy of your certified birth certificate, which you need to get a photo ID in the state of Missouri. And that's before you talk about the barriers like access to DMV offices, uh, many of which have banker's hours, not open evenings, not open weekends. Right? Um, many of them are not on bus routes, right? Because they service drivers. So if you don't have a driver's license, it's not that easy to get to a DMV office. And on top of that, many states that implemented photo ID requirements then proceeded, because those laws are so expensive, <laughs> to, as a cost-saving measure, close a number of DMV offices. Now, this is just one overlay from Texas after they implemented their photo ID requirement. Check this out. Um, the darker the color is the larger percentage of non-white voters. And so what you see and what we found was that um, the closures disproportionately hit hardest in communities of color. There were some places where uh, the nearest DMV office was over 180 miles away. So again, so you're someone who doesn't have a driver's license. Subway is not taking you 180 miles across southwest Texas. Right? If you're working if you're a single mom, if you're taking care of elderly parents, if you're a person with disabilities, you're not gonna go do all that, right? Alabama did the same thing. It passed a photo ID law, and then it proceeded to close DMV offices in 34 counties that were disproportionately African-American counties. And so here in Missouri, there are provisions in the law that say, well, the state's supposed to help you get some of those underlying documents if you don't have them. But that's also part of what makes these laws so expensive. These laws are very expensive to implement, even taking aside the lack of sort of valid kind of government purpose behind them, because we know here in Missouri there's never been a case, a prosecuted case of voter impersonation. Um, they're expensive because uh, it's costly to get all those underlying documents. And by the way, the state won't help you if you've got errors on those documents like Rosenel Eaton had. Right? Here in Missouri, they, um, they estimated the, the Missouri legislature, the um, fiscal oversight estimated that it would cost $15 million over three years to implement Missouri's photo ID law. The legislature appropriated Senator, uh, Secretary Ashcroft um, $1.5 million. Um, and part of the problem is that it costs a lot to educate people about their rights. And that's sort of one of the reasons that um, uh, we filed another lawsuit involving these appropriations, because the state wasn't effectively educating people about these laws. So the lawsuit that I'm counsel on, we filed on behalf of the Missouri State Conference of the NAACP and Legal Women Voters. Um, That's part of our team, some of the folks from the NAACP and Legal Women Voters. Here we are, this is trial. We had trial this August. There's some uh, students from Lincoln University who were um, plaintiffs in the case um, who didn't have I IDs. They had student IDs, right? Um, they have no need to drive. We're still waiting a decision in that case. 
Uh, if we are successful, it could result in the law being struck from the books. But again, a different measure is, is making its way through the, the Missouri legislature right now. And so I'm going to sort of wrap here with, um, with a quick story about my mom, because I think I know some of you know her. Um, and because she's an, a really in, inspiration for why I do this work, um, my mom's Joy Lieberman. She lives a few blocks from here. She's born and raised in University City, a graduate of U City High School a um, long time ago. And uh, as many of you know, she served on the school board in University City for 24 years. Um, they, they even named a school after her. <laughs> this is the alternative school. It's across the street from Brittany Woods. It's called the Joy Lieberman Learning Center. Her uh, driver's license says Joy Lieberman. When she ran for office, her yard sign said Joy Lieberman. Her voter registration says Joy Lieberman. Many of you know her and probably call her Joy Lieberman. Um, <laughs> the one place that Joy Lieberman um, does not uh, exist on is her birth certificate. Those of you who know her well, and that would only be a very, very small number of people, know that Joy is actually not her first name. She does not like her first name. She'd probably disown me if I told you what it was. Um, Joy's her middle name, and that's the name she's always gone by her whole life, but it's not listed on her birth certificate. And so a few years back when she had to go, she just recently stopped driving um, this last year, so she's got an expired license now, which, by the way, would not be valid to vote in Missouri because it just expired. So it's not considered valid, even though it has her name, her current address, her photo, her likeness. So she had to go renew that or get a non-driver's license and had to produce that underlying birth certificate. She would have no way of showing that the person listed on that birth certificate is the same person who is Joy Lieberman today. So these laws are, are and, and for, to change that, she would have to get a post-dated birth certificate. Uh, she got interviewed by CNN a few years ago, and she's 88 now, and, and she said, who is around to attest <laughs> to what my parents named me 88 years ago? I don't think I could find someone to sign that affidavit. <laughs> They're not around. Um, and, and she's just one example, right? This is, this, these laws, um, when we start sort of othering people and talking about sort of who doesn't deserve to vote, we need to remember that these kinds of limitations um, affect people um, throughout our communities. And when we start talking about people being undeserving of having a voice, it's important to remember people like Mrs. Eaton, people like my mom, um, people like probably folks that many of you may know, folks like that, our lead plaintiff in Wisconsin, Betty Jones, I took her slide off of here. Um, she had been an active member of her community. She had lived in Ohio, um, moved to Wisconsin after her husband died. And she had just renewed her driver's license in Ohio right before moving there. So she had a current valid driver's license. But because Wisconsin had implemented a photo ID law that said only Wisconsin driver's license count, she couldn't use that current valid driver's license from Ohio. So when the first thing she did when she got there as a new widow, was to go to the DMV to get a Wisconsin ID. She couldn't do so because she didn't have a certified copy of her birth certificate. Why? Because as an African-American woman who was born in the segregated South, guess where her mother did not give birth to her? Right. She was born at home to a midwife. And not like a state-certified midwife that keeps records, like a neighbor, a lady down the street who did it for everybody. And they wrote that information in the Bible. She didn't have, and many, many, many people like her, she simply didn't have a certified birth certificate and it never presented a problem. She had a passport, she had a driver's license, she had social security, she had been an elected official herself. They could not, they, they attempted to try and get a post-dated birth certificate they went back to Tennessee where she was born, her daughter did, her daughter basically had to quit her job. She spent so much time going through these records, tried to get Tennessee to find the grade school records of the grade school Betty Jones attended in the 1940s in Tennessee, because that's one way you can sort of prove, if you can prove you were five years old in 1945, then that may prove that you probably were born in 1940. 
the segregated grade school that she attended had long burned down and had closed. There was no records left. They submitted the birth certificates of Betty's children that listed her as the mother to prove that she was alive. That was insufficient. She, she never got it. She actually died not ever being able to vote again. So that's why people are, are fighting back. And um, when we talk about what you can do, I mean, that's why we're seeing people take to the streets. That's why we're seeing people protest. Because people have a right to be heard. And when you silence people, you're going to find a way to have their voice heard. Okay, so people are fighting back. And there's things that we can do to help protect the right to vote right here in Missouri. One of them, first you can join me in opposing House Bill 1600, but I won't get too political with you here. But another one that you can do is participate in election protection. I'm gonna leave a bunch of these cards here. Again, this is a national hotline. Um, we have a national call center here in Missouri. These calls are answered by Missouri attorneys. And what we do is we put neighbors out at their own polling places to help their neighbors navigate the voting process. We have poem cards with information about their rights. This hotline, 866-R-VOTE, is live. It's actually live all year long right now. We also have hotlines in Spanish, Arabic, and Asian languages. You can sign up for as short as a two-hour shift. Um, and it makes an incredible difference. We're the only people at the polling place on election day that aren't there to sell voters some bill of goods. We're the only people there not for a ballot measure, not for a candidate. We're simply there to help make sure that all voters are able to cast a ballot. And we make sure that those voters don't have to leave a polling place without casting a ballot on election day and can get them on the phone right away in real time with a lawyer, uh, with a community advocate who can help make sure that they're able to cast a ballot. So I do hope that you can join me for that. And I'm going to, I think I'm going to stop there. There are some other pieces that I can talk about as well, but I want to make sure that, um, that there's time to hear from some of you. We have just about five minutes for questions. I'll go to Lisa because I saw her hand first. So you said that when those um, bills came up in the different states that they were almost all identical. What's the organization behind writing all of those bills? Yeah, so um, it, back in 2011, the, the, there was an organization called the American Legislative Exchange Council. That, uh, that, that produced the draft legislation. Um, they were significantly supported by the Koch brothers. The American Legislative Exchange Council got so much flack for that that they sort of stopped working on, on photo ID proposals, but the, the money from Koch Industries has continued to support um, voter suppression legislation nationwide. Can you uh, just outline what non-photo ID uh, identification people can present at voting places, um, just so we know. There it is. So you can present a photo ID, which is like a Missouri driver's license, a Missouri non-driver's license, um, a, a military ID, a US passport. But you can also present a voter notification card, a student ID from a college or university or, or technical school located in the state of Missouri. Um, it can actually be any government document that has um, your name and current address, so a current utility bill, right? Um, a current pay stub. If it's current, it would have to have your name and current. It's a government, any government document with your name and current address. When we were in class for voting for March, um, one thing that we talked really hard and long about is who can vote and who can't vote and what kind of ID you have to have. The other thing is make sure when you get your little sample ballot in the mail, look to see where your voting place is because they've gone from 459 voting places down to 359. The other wise thing to do is if you don't get that little white card in the mail or green card or whatever the color it is for the sample ballot, make sure that you call the county or the city voting um, office to make sure that you are still on the rolls because there's been a lot of people, I don't care if you're white, black, green, yellow, purple, gay, straight, 
there's been a lot of people eliminated from the voting polls this year for some reason. Yes. So the next election it will be the March presidential primaries. The voter registration deadline is coming up this week, February 12th. So, and what that means is if you're not registered, please make sure you get registered. You can do so online now in the state of Missouri, sos.mo.gov. But if you have moved, you're going to have to update your voter registration as well. Unfortunately, um, despite all of the technology we have, they can forward your mail. Um, the tax collector knows where to find you if you've moved, but unfortunately your voter registration does not move with you if you move. And you're gonna have to update your voter registration if you've moved to a new jurisdiction, a new county, you're going to have to register anew because elections are decidedly local creatures and every 116 election jurisdictions in the state of Missouri all keep their own roles. And here in the St. Louis area, St. Louis City and St. Louis County are two different jurisdictions. So if you have moved from the Central West End to University City, you've moved to a new election jurisdiction and St. Louis County doesn't have you on the rolls. You have to register by February 12th to vote on March 10th. I had a question about the, the non-photo ID documents. Do they explicitly have to be a paper document or will they accept electronic bank statements? You stumped her. Does it have to be the original document or can it be printed at home? Yeah, so, so this, is, this is one problem with the fact that there are not very many lawyers in the Missouri legislature. The, the, the actual language of the statute doesn't say. Um, it's, it does not answer that question. Uh, and so the truth of the matter is that the way voting laws get implemented is really so often just left to the discretion of the poll worker who's attempting to implement it. And so the law itself is silent on that. What you're going to find is that a particular poll worker, what we try and do is sit down with, uh, with the election directors in advance and, and look over their poll worker trainings to help them um, inform sort of more uniform practices. But the truth of the matter is, the answer to that could be different when you come and vote here at this polling place than if you go vote over at Jackson Park. So we're going to wrap up there. Uh, remember, Denise will be back with us this evening um, after the screening of the movie Rig. I'll, I'll do that in a second. Um, next Sunday, uh, Dr. Will Ross, the, uh, uh, the Associate Vice President at Washington Medical um, School's uh, Program for Diversity and Inclusion will be with us. We're going to be talking both about the history and the present reality of medicine, particularly in the black community and the disparities we see in healthcare in this region across history and today. Um, so we hope you will join us for that. Will you join me in thanking Denise Lieberman? And know that Holy Communion will be getting involved. Um, we're going to be joining a coalition alongside Colrena with the NAACP, the AME Zion, and a number of churches that are working both on voter registration, get out the vote, and election protection. Um, so do feel free to pick up one of Denise's cards, or you can, on our welcome table in the main entryway, sign up for the faithful action alerts, because we will be organizing particular Holy Communion groups to go to voter registration actions, voter protection actions, and get out the vote actions through this election season. Thank you all so much.